Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Today, uh, today's webinar will be focusing on the Finland trial site results and lesson learned on uh, 5G for Cam. My name is Seve Christoforu, and I am a Communication and Dissemination Officer with ICCS, uh, the Institute of Communication and Computer System in Athens, Greece, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, before I move on to introducing the speakers of uh, today's 5G Mobix webinar, I would like to inform you that uh, throughout the webinar you will have the opportunity to submit any questions you might have to the question box that you can find on your control panel. We will collect these questions to address them towards the end at the Q&A at, at the designated Q&A session. If you have any technical problems, any technical issues, for example, if you cannot see the screen, of, uh, if you have any um, audio problems, uh, feel free to use the chat box that you can find again on the control panel on your screen. So you can contact one, uh, me or any other of the, um, or Julie, um, we are the organizers, and we will attend to it. Now I would like to um, ask the speakers to turn on their cameras so I can introduce them and let me also move to the next slide. All right. Okay. Um, first, uh, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Oscar Agu. He's a postdoctoral researcher with the Department of Communications and Networking at the Alto University. His research interests focus on optimization models, mathematical programming, and machine learning with the application of these techniques to wireless network problems. Today, he will introduce us to the 5G Mobix project, uh, focusing mostly on the, fine, uh, the Finland trial site. Our next speaker uh, will be Mr. Timo Mustone. With uh, over 10 years of experience in the field of international innovation, uh, Mr. Mustona now focuses on helping to solve future automotive uh, challenges. He does this through his role as a portfolio manager for research and innovation collaboration at uh, Sensible4, which is a startup in Finland that develops uh, full stack autonomous driving software for commercial last mile vehicles that operate in all weather conditions. Today, he will be taking us through the role of Sensible4 at the 5G Mobix Finland trial site, focusing on the remote driving test case. Last but uh, not least, we have with us today Dr. Edward Mudafangwe. Uh, he's the, uh, the trial site leader of uh, the Finland trial site and also the co-manager. Edward has served as a staff scientist at the Department of Communications and uh, Networks of uh, the Alto University School of Electrical Engineering. Previously, he had multiple roles as a lecturer, researcher, and uh, project manager in various national and international projects. He has authored and co-authored over 80 scientific publications and has also served in uh, leadership roles in organizing committees of various, uh, various international conferences, uh, for example, um, IEEE and others. Today, he will be describing the trial objectives, the demo storyboard, test environment setup of the Finland trial site, as well as he will be taking us through the results and lessons learned after we watch a video from the 5G Mobix demo in uh, Finland. It's a pleasure to have you uh, here and thank you also to all the uh, attendees for joining us today. And without further ado, um, I suggest to move on to the, to the first presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. I will be introducing the 5G Mobix project and Finland trial site. 5G Mobix project is an EU-funded innovation action. It has been funded by Horizon 2020 ICT18 Core, which specifically focuses on 5G for connected and automated mobility. The project officially started in November 2018, and it contains six partners. 50 partners are from 11 countries within Europe, and 10 are non-EU-funded partners from China and South Korea. 
The main technical objective of the project is to accelerate the deployment of 5G at cross-border areas. In particular, we carry out trials along cross-border corridors to assess 5G capabilities for SICAM and qualify the 5G infrastructure and evaluate the benefits of 5G within the SICAM context. We also identify spectrum allocation gaps and contribute to the standardization and 5G CEF preparation. From a business perspective, 5G Mobix aims defining deployment scenarios and recommendations, including cross-border context. We perform cost and benefit analysis and impact assessments. We also identify new business opportunities for 5G enabled SICAM and investigate legal, regulatory, and security issues. The 5G Mobix project contains partners from telecommunication and connectivity to vehicle manufacturing, from R&D to the business. The main objective of the 5G Mobix project is to assess the cross-border scenarios. In our trials, we have two cross-border corridors located between Spain and Portugal and Greece and Turkey. In addition to these two cross-border corridors, there are six complementary trial sites. Four of these complementary trial sites are located in Europe, in Finland, Germany, Netherlands, and France, and two are located in Asia, in China and Korea. During 5G Mobix trials, we use 30 5G GNOPs that are configured in non-standalone architecture. We also evaluate the potential for evolving to standalone architecture. During our trials, we use 24 SAE level four automated vehicles and focus mainly on five use cases that are outlined by 3GPP. Namely, we focus on advanced driving, vehicles platooning, extended sensors, remote driving, and vehicle quality service support. Moving from this general overview of the 5G Mobix project to the Finland trial site. In Finland, there are two partners, Aalto University and Sensible4. The trials are performed within the autonomy campus of Aalto University in Espoo, Finland. During our trials, we use two test networks. At first, we use Aalto 5G test networks that is configured in non-standalone and standalone mode. And then at the second phase of our trials, we use commercial networks in non-standalone mode. During our trials, we use two max. And in terms of the vehicles, we use one SAE level four automated vehicle, as well as various connected vehicles that are equipped with multiple SIM onboard units that can connect to multiple networks at the same time. During our trials, we focus on two main use cases, namely extended sensors and remote driving. In addition to our trials in Finland, we also contribute to the cross-border corridors. For the Spain and Portugal corridor, we focus on testing multi-SIM operations in a CBC and edge service migration for HD maps user stories. In Greece and Turkey corridor, we focus on live video streaming server and client for see what I see user story. So this is a brief introduction for the project as well as the finished trial site. My colleagues are going to be providing further details. Thank you very much. And now we will move on to the next presentation by Mr. Mustonen. Hi, I'm Timo Mustonen from Sensible4, and uh, we uh, are a self-driving technology company on a mission to make shared and driverless mobility mainstream. So Sensible4 is a Finnish startup uh, founded in 2017, uh, and currently with about 80 employees uh, working towards uh, 
uh, our, uh, our focus, which is uh, creating a level 4 self-driving system uh, for last mile applications that work in uh, all weather conditions. Um, the, uh, the key from our, us is that we've, uh, uh, our approach to autonomous driving is a bit unique. We've solved uh, one of the biggest problems, uh, which is uh, the issue of bad weather. Um, our uh, self-driving solution uh, uh, uses a unique probabilistic approach that enables vehicles to drive in varying weather conditions, be it uh, rain, snow, uh, icy roads, and etc. Uh, we use uh, LiDAR sensors and probabilistic mapping uh, that results in a computationally efficient and robust positioning solution. And uh, this technology uh, is based on decades of research and development uh, from our founders uh, and the Aalto University of Helsinki. Um, in uh, 5G Mobics, Sensible 4 was part of the Finnish trial site demo and uh, what was used from us uh, was the uh, was one of our test vehicles called AVA. Uh, it's based on Renault's electric vehicle model named Twizy and uh, we altered it uh, to uh, house a drive-by-wire system and we also equipped it with uh, uh, sensors and a computing unit for autonomous driving. Um, so the vehicle now uh, hosts uh, uh, front and rear lidars, uh, GNSS RTK, uh, cameras, uh, uh, and inertial measurement units, uh, odometers, uh, and, uh, and other things. Uh, it also hosts, uh, host, uh, houses a radar, but radars were not utilized in this particular test case. And uh, naturally, the vehicle uh, is equipped with sensible force autonomous driving software. Um, what our motivation uh, was behind uh, taking part in 5G Mobix uh, is that uh, for in, in the future, uh, challenge for, challenges for autonomous vehicles come from management of uh, uh, vehicle fleets uh, in a rem remote way. Uh, not every vehicle can have uh, its in-person driver, uh, safety driver. So uh, the possibility to uh, monitor, uh, monitor the vehicles remotely uh, becomes a very important, uh, very important aspect, and uh, therefore, 5G technology is something that's uh, high, highly uh, promising to us and uh, a potential key enabling technology for us as an end user. So it is important for us to understand the possibilities and the limitations that we could face uh, in remote operations over 5G networks. Uh, current uh, remote solutions uh, in the industry use 4G or LTE uh, as it is the uh, prevalent technology. Uh, 5G, uh, 5G technology is not quite set on, uh, on the roads at all locations and therefore um, uh, the capability addition that 5G brings is important for us to understand. Um, and also it is important for us to understand uh, if we can enhance our solution with uh, new, new features, new, new technologies uh, that could benefit from, from this uh, increased uh, capabilities. And uh, moreover, um, the unique local climate, being the winter, uh, allows the uh, evaluation of, of CCAM uh, possibilities and 5G uh, workings under Nordic uh, prolonged harsh winter uh, seasons. Uh, some of the uh, Finnish test drives were done over uh, winter periods. Uh, next you'll have to hear a little bit more about the uh, uh, test itself from, from Aalto University. Thank you. Great, and now we will see the, the description of the uh, trial site. Welcome to this presentation titled Description of Trial Objectives, Demo Sorry Board, Test Environment, etc. My name is Adelum Tafungwa uh, from Aalto University. 
The Finland trial site has two user stories. One is on the extended census category, and where we consider a case that the vehicle is changing not just networks, but also changing, uh, having a possibility to change uh, MEC or multi access uh, edge computing platforms and moving from one network to another. In this particular user story, our tri site has been validating a solution for MEC discovery and migration when the vehicle does this change. In this particular case, the MEC platforms are providing uh, uh, computation resources for video crowdsourcing and HD maps applications. The second user story is on a redundant uh, network environment that is supporting uh, remote driving. In this case, we are considering a case where uh, the vehicle, an autonomous vehicle, uh, is able to select or aggregate uh, resources from links uh, for multiple uh, 5G networks. This particular case is the focus of our work. The remote driving user story has some interesting challenges and uh, considered solutions, one of which we'll focus on in this particular uh, webinar uh, from, from our trials. An autonomous vehicle uh, on, the, on the trajectory has a need to be able to exchange uh, data, uh, in this case with the remote operation center, uh, where there is a remote human operator that is manning that center. And this, in case, uh, would refer to the exchange of uh, uh, contextual uh, uh, information about the vehicle on this road uh, to the remote operating center and command messages and so on from the remote operating center to the vehicle. In this case, we require a continuous, reliable, and high-capacity vehicle to network connectivity. To that end, session and service continuity is a significant challenge in 5G networks. This could be within national borders, where you tend to have limited or discontinuous 5G coverage, coverage holes or handover failures, maybe network congestion in certain times of days or certain locations. At cross-border areas, you may experience interruptions uh, when executing roaming procedures when it was going from one country to another. The Finland trial site is evaluating solutions for vehicle to network service continuity in a multi network or multi PLMN environment using multi SIM uh, onboard units. That is, an onboard unit equipped with multiple uh, uh, SIM cards able to attach uh, to different networks. Let us take a moment to describe a bit more the multi SIM OBU solution that has been used in uh, Finland trial site. Uh, the solution that has been in, in use uh, for service continuity in the multi filament environment in the Finland trial site is from a vendor uh, uh, called Good News Systems that has typically uh, deployed these solutions for critical communications uh, scenarios uh, such as those used by public safety products. This multi-SIM OBU solution uh, is based on mobile IP tunnel, where you have a mobile uh, IP gateway server terminating a MIP tunnel, as well as VPN tunnels that are created over this MIP tunnel. And this is created between the OBU and the MIP server, as shown in the figure on the right, where you, see, you may have a tunnels created over multiple uh, 5G networks. In this case, we're using a network and country and currently breathe that are overlapping as an example. There are two modes that are supported by this solution. There is the link selection mode, where the OBU is continuously monitoring different connections from these two networks and selecting the best one. The criteria used for this uh, selection uh, could be based in a combination of uh, signal strength, latency, the priority of the RAT, or radio access technology, and so on. Then 
there is the second mode, which is the link aggregation mode, where the OBU is simultaneously utilizing multiple connections uh, from the two networks. Uh, the implementation used uh, the Finan Trasat has two 5G modems, each with a corresponding uh, uh, SIM slot. These modems are from Vendor Sierra, and they support uh, 5G in a standalone mode initially, but uh, later upgraded to also support uh, standalone. Uh, the modems uh, work in uh, LTE and 5G uh, sub 6 GHz band specifically the N97, N78 band, using the Finland trial set. The chipsets are from Qualcomm, and they have uh, an M2 form part. Typically, this box would have been able to support up to four SIM cards, but uh, with the current M2 form factor, uh, uh, only two SIM cards are supported. Two modems and two SIM cards are supported. This OBU uh, was deployed uh, in an autonomous, autonomous vehicle that has been presented separately. And it's a vehicle provided by the company Sensible4, our partners in the Finland trial side. Uh, it's an SAE level 4 automation. And it's road legal, so it can operate in open roads with mixed traffic. It's speeds of up to 40 kilometers per hour. You may see in the figure on the right, the OBU deployed in the rear of the car and connected to PCs, uh, including the vehicle PC, and the PC will be deployed to be able to do a, a me take measurements of the various uh, key performance indicators. The antennas of the OBU are placed at the rooftop uh, to enable uh, improved uh, 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 coverage and enhance our performance. In this case, we have two antennas uh, for each modem seen there. A background on the test and setup and uh, uh, test cases. What you're seeing here is a picture of the test environment, uh, which has uh, a multiple, uh, uh, which has coverage for multiple uh, elements. Uh, created by two commercial networks. This area is in the uh, ESPO autonomy uh, area and the Auto University campus. Both of the commercial uh, uh, networks are configured in 5G NSA mode uh, and operate in the 3.5 uh, gigahertz 5G band with an LTE anchor at 2.6 gigahertz. An interesting thing to note here is the actual coverage where you may not, uh, in some places, uh, uh, one network will have better coverage uh, than the other. Uh, this creates uh, some interesting scenarios as far as the use of uh, multi sim uh, solutions are concerned. This is an uh, additional perspective of the two networks uh, uh, that are being used, also created from a uh, drive test uh, carried out uh, before the trials, where you do note the, the difference in uh, the throughput performance between the two networks, and the, both the uplink and the downlink. Uh, here we are showing about the case of NR only, but also the EU from uh, new radio dual connectivity where the, the devices that are able to aggregate resources from the LT and 5G and other networks. Again, here one can also note the, the disparity of performance between the uplink and the downlink, even for the same network. Uh, let us now take some time to present the remote driving demo story board. The rem Remote driving uh, a user story uh, is conducted in uh, an area covered by uh, an overlap of the two networks that we discussed in the previous slide. Uh, at the top, you may also see the remote operation center, 
and which has the fleet control server as well as the video streaming server and the and the console uh, that provides the interface for the uh, for the remote human operator. At the beginning of the trajectory, uh, the vehicle is connected uh, to one of the networks, and it's sending uh, two lidar streams: one for the front lidar, one for the rear lidar sensor, as well as status message that is updating the vehicle speed, location, and so on. This information is sent in the uplink direction from the vehicle to the remote operation center. At some point, the vehicle faces an obstacle and it may request some assistance from the remote operating center, and but also at the same time starts to transmit a video stream, both live and a pre-recorded stream taken 20 seconds before the vehicle encountered the obstacle. This should give the remote human operator more, uh, more visual perspective of, uh, of the situation that led to the vehicle to come into a halt. The vehicle would then uh, create an alternative trajectory that is also sent to the remote operating center, where the remote human operator would review the new trajectory uh, proposal and uh, Accept it so that the vehicle may continue on that new trajectory and maneuver around the obstacle. The vehicle uh, would continue to drive, sending the two LiDAR streams, the HD video stream, as well as the status message in the app. Uh, at this point, uh, the vehicle, depending on the configuration of the view, may be operating with a single SIM only still connected to the same network, or maybe using either the other network or both, depending on the multi SIM configuration. And this process continues until the vehicle uh, comes to a halt at the end of the shredder. As you saw, uh, in the particular storyboard, uh, there are multiple traffic flows that are created in the uplink and the downlink. Uh, to that end, we are analyzing in our trials uh, all the traffic streams, uh, starting from the, the first traffic stream is the sensor data, that is the LiDAR streams from the vehicle to the, to the rock. And this is for the front and rear LiDAR. And then we have the status messages uh, sent from the vehicle to the rock. Then we have the video streams uh, from the vehicle to the rock also in the uplink. And the command message sent from the, from the rock uh, to the vehicle when accepting the new project. Each one of these flows may have some KPIs of interest that we wish to analyze for. Uh, this could include the experience uh, data rate, uh, latency, reliability, typically calculated as the packet cost, and the mobility interaction time. To be able to carry out these measurements, uh, we have been using uh, a number of tools, uh, primarily being the, a, a tool from, a, from a part, another partner, the like Mobile Project, DECRA, uh, that has provided us the tax for uh, testing solution, which includes a controller and, and a number of distributed software agents deployed along, along the, uh, the path taken by the different traffic flows. And this allows for uh, measurements to be carried out between any two points of control and observation where we deploy these agents. In our case, as you can see on the figure above, we have agents uh, deployed uh, within the vehicle and another agent uh, deployed in the remote operating center. Apart from that, we also have an inbuilt uh, logging tool in the multi uh, view that allows us to take uh, logs or KPI measurements uh, for each uh, modern SIM. These measurements or logs may include indications of whether a particular scene 
is active or inactive uh, at any particular time point. The signal strength, uh, the round trip time uh, latency, time sums, the radio access technology used, cell ID, here and an ID, and so on. These are very useful measurements in understanding uh, any transitions that may occur uh, in terms of the connectivity uh, by the multi sim of the use when switching from one network to another, or in some cases utilizing both networks at the same time. So, to conclude this presentation, uh, we've introduced the remote driving user story and uh, some of its uh, key challenges uh, related to uh, uh, service continuity and the considered solution of the multi sim of the and the overall experimental setup. In the next presentation, we'll review some measurement results obtained uh, from this uh, remote driving uh, scenario. Great, and now we will watch a video from the Finland trial site demonstration that took place in uh, April 28th at the Otanyami campus in Aalto University. For the last two videos, we are going to look at the trial results and uh, next the uh, lessons learned. But first, the trial results. Welcome to the uh, presentations on the trial results uh, from the Finland uh, trial site. Uh, my name is Adam Tafungwa and I'm from Aalto University. Before going to the results, let us uh, shortly recall uh, the overall trial setup. As noted in previous presentation, uh, the trial that we have presented the results for is on the remote driving uh, user story. And this was the storyboard uh, that was uh, presented earlier, where a vehicle uh, uh, on a trajectory 
is sending uh, uh, multiple traffic streams in the uplink, including uh, uh, LIDAR data streams and status messages, uh, as well as uh, a, a video streams. And in the down, in the downlink, uh, command messages uh, sent from the remote operating center on ROC uh, to the vehicle. And depending on the OPU configuration, this vehicle may be using a, only one network out of these two, or then alternatively a, a selecting a, one of the two, and depending on which one is the has the best uh, uh, connectivity conditions, or or utilizing both simultaneously. A network uh, that is uh, a, a, a vehicle that, that is traversing uh, uh, on these networks uh, may have uh, some uh, network impacts that uh, hinder the performance of, of the remote driving so let's, let's take this moment to be able to sort of understand uh, what may happen uh, uh, out of this uh, 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 out of these uh, remote driving uh, scenarios, as we saw earlier in some of the, uh, the demo videos. One issue that uh, has been uh, a major challenge is the regular uh, outage, where you have uh, the LiDAR or video streams uh, frozen or lost completely, uh, so that the remote the human operator uh, is not able to have uh, this enhanced situation awareness of the vehicle uh, from the uh, from the remote operating center. The vehicle status as well stands up as a status message showing the vehicle speed, location, and so on. Uh, it may also be uh, appearing uh, delayed or lost on the map. Uh, so we have an effect uh, uh, which is called uh, the, the warping effect. Here, yeah, a challenge is uh, uh, the vehicle uh, a maneuver delay uh, uh, due to the delay in the command messages uh, that are sent from the uh, remote operating center uh, after the, the operator approves the new trajectory. Uh, vehicle usually would not be able to move at the obstacle until this command is uh, received. And any delay in this, receiving this command would mean that the vehicle is stuck on the, behind the obstacle and also blocking traffic. However, it has to be noted that uh, sometimes there are also other aspects on the road that may uh, delay the vehicle from beginning its maneuver, such as in this case you see below here, and uh, the vehicle pausing its maneuver until some of the overtaking vehicles get past. So, it, those challenges we saw earlier uh, uh, provide some uh, interesting idea on how uh, the lack of uh, good service continuity uh, impacts the remote driving user story and presents uh, a, a number of cases where we can try to observe how effective these multi sim uh, multi solutions uh, compared to uh, traditional single SIM approaches. So to study that, uh, we conducted uh, uh, trials uh, in the end of April uh, 2022, and this included five test cases. The idea of these test cases was to be able to provide a comparison between the single SIM uh, OBU case as a benchmark versus the multi-SIM approach. And here we consider either link selection or link aggregation. The table below shows the different test cases. And we have a test case uh, in the first row, which is a, a multi-SIM with link selection. Here we have a network uh, called uh, FIMN05 is the priority, whereas FIMN06 is a secondary network that a subscriber of this particular network is able to escape to when this, the conditions are deteriorated here. 
the situation for the next uh, uh, test case is changed where now network uh, 06 is primary network whereas 05 is the secondary network then we have uh, the other test case where it's the link aggregation where both network 6 and 5 are used simultaneously and then we have the benchmark cases where we're only using network 5 or then we're only using uh, network 6. Some of the test case uh, short IDs, uh, uh, all these test case short IDs come with a, a certain numbering of 1 and 2. This essentially refers to the direction of travel where as an example FI this case A53.1 refers to the case where the vehicle goes in route one, and that is from a location one of the test route to location two. Whereas FI3.2 refers to route two, where the vehicle goes from location two to location one in the opposite direction. Now let us present some selected evaluation uh, results uh, from the trials conducted. So just to quickly recall, uh, we have uh, four traffic flows, uh, the later streams uh, from the vehicle to the rock. Then we have uh, the state sub messages, also from the vehicle to the rock. Uh, then the HD video streams from the vehicle to rock and the command messages uh, from the rock uh, to the video, to the vehicle. And any of these streams may utilize one or more of these uh, a, a KPIs of interest, uh, whether it's data rate latency, uh, packet loss, or mobile interruption time. Uh, so it is clear uh, to note that uh, we have four traffic flows, anywhere from one to four uh, KPIs per traffic flows, and five test cases. And each of these test cases could, had 10 to 15 uh, test runs. Uh, this has created a large number of, of results. Uh, so typically, a result for a particular uh, for a particular traffic flow is, is represented uh, with the statistics in these kind of tables and using a, a, a convention that was formulated within the 5D Mobix project uh, where you have the target value, the various statistical values and uh, box plots created uh, for the different test runs uh, in this case it was for the latency uh, for uh, the status messages. Uh, one of the uh, uh, key areas for managing these large data sets is to focus on only KPIs uh, that are significant for a particular test case, uh, for a particular traffic flow. So for instance, uh, the status uh, 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 messages uh, I have a very low throughput, so throughput is, is, is rather a, a low priority a KPI, but latency is significant. So throughput could be ignored in that sense in, in, in the more deep analysis. And also we take an approach of presenting a consolidated view that allows the comparison across all the five test cases that we saw in the earlier slides. And as a first result, uh, we're presenting uh, for the, uh, the sensor data that is the later uh, streamed and uh, the throughput for that. So these later streams are uh, uh, typically UDP uh, traffic flows, the constant bitrate, uh, uh, producing traffic at a rate of about 7.3 uh, megabits per second uh, for each LIDAR stream. So for one for the one stream from the front LIDAR and for the rear, rear LIDAR. Uh, the results are presented here uh, according uh, to the different test cases. So you can see the two single SIM cases, uh, the two multi-SIM cases with link selection, where here 
5 is the priority, 6 is, and in this case 6 is the priority, and this is the link aggregation case. Uh, what is clear here is that uh, there are notable improvements uh, in both the cases of uh, uh, link selection uh, and link aggregation. Uh, here, for instance, now we're comparing uh, the case where you only have a single SIM, network 5, and this is now a link selection opportunity where you can use network 5 as well as network 6. Um, one thing that uh, has been noted here, of course, is that uh, the improvements that one gets when using these uh, multi-SIM approaches uh, depends on the on the network that you have uh, selected as the priority. So here there was a, a network six, which was not performing uh, uh, very well. And you do get announcements, but the fact that you are still prioritizing network six, uh, the improvements are not as significant as the other two cases. Uh, this is another way of uh, looking at uh, an example from some specific uh, a, a test run. And for the throughput, where here you can see uh, the case for a single SIM uh, with metric six, and there's a, some a, a moments where uh, you actually lose the the, 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 the lattice streams completely. So this appears uh, as the as the, as the a ladder screen uh, freezing uh, from the human operator's point of view. And this is a case with a multi sim link aggregation where you have a, a, a bit more continuous uh, a, a ladder stream with very few uh, traffic dips. So showing clear improvements when using link aggregation compared to the single sim case. Uh, another way of analyzing uh, the performance uh, of the solution uh, for the LIDAR stream is uh, looking at the reliability evaluated here in terms of uh, a packet loss. And as observed before, you can see the, the improvements with the multi-SIM case compared to the, to the single SIM uh, test case. With limited improvement, of course, for the case where the, the priority network uh, uh, has a performance which is uh, uh, not as good as the as a secondary metric that is not metric problem. Uh, and as before, uh, we can see again uh, the, uh, the packet loss uh, for the uh, for the lighter streams uh, when you have 100 percent. 100% packet loss uh, leading to the, 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 the freezing of the lighter streams uh, due to the bad network conditions. And this is the case um, uh, with the multi uh, where you may have uh, some high packet loss, but this is for very short uh, bursts of time. So it becomes significant uh, uh, when you have a more a, a, a continuous uh, burst, a longer a continuous burst of, of loss uh, that would lead to, to, to freezing or complete loss of the lighter streams from the human operator perspective. Uh, as a comparison, uh, we look at uh, the video uh, traffic stream, which is also UDP, but this is now having this variable bit rate. Uh, uh, the data rate for this is uh, almost the same as we saw in the case of the LIDAR stream, of course, but this varying from between six to eight megabits per second. And one interesting thing we did note here was that uh, the improvements that you may get uh, uh, with uh, the multi -SIM solutions are not as, uh, as more pronounced as the case for the uh, constant bitrate LIDAR streams that we saw earlier. Uh, and this is also seen here when comparing the uh, the packet loss that you see the mean packet loss that you see when, for the case of the lighter uh, compared to the case of the video. 
this of course uh, is attributed to the fact that uh, uh, the video streams have inbuilt uh, uh, late adaptation and uh, in the streaming protocols and the encoders that are used. So some improvements uh, uh, at application level uh, can go a long way in uh, managing the, uh, the turbulence that you see in the metrics along the trajectory. Uh, here we're showing a result for the, the status uh, message uh, traffic flows, uh, looking at the latency. So this is the TCP traffic flows. It's a constant generated data stream at a rate of about 100 kilobits per second, so very low throughput. But then we put a, a, a target of uh, latency of 160 milliseconds of uptick time. Uh, generally, what we observe is, uh, is an acceptable performance overall, although it does seem interesting that uh, in cases where you have a frequent uh, link uh, a selection of the selection when using the uh, link selection model, the Mortis immobilium, uh, you may actually have a, a, a slight uh, increase in, in the latency. So this is the case, for example, when you're operating only with uh, a network five versus the case where now uh, you have uh, network five and using network six as a secondary network. And same is also seen with the reverse where network six and here six is the priority but also using it. It is noted that in this link selection mode the network uh, uh, changes uh, roughly every 30 seconds. Uh, this is equivalent to a uh, network change every 300 meters uh, when now one is assuming the, the trial speed we are running at for, which was about 40 kilometers per hour. Then the, uh, the final uh, example result we're showing here is from uh, uh, the command messages. And again, here we're looking at uh, the latency. Uh, this command message is a, it's a TCP, and they're sent in the downlink. Uh, and unlike the status message, these are episodic. So you only send command messages when uh, a remote request has been triggered by the vehicle uh, and the remote human operator presses a command message for accepting the trajectory. So you have very little traffic uh, 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 flowing and so you may have up to just a few packets uh, over a whole test run. Here we were looking at the target again of also 160 milliseconds round trip time and in most all cases uh, uh, the messages are being able to set, be sent in that within that time bound. Uh, from our observation, this was the least impacted uh, uh, traffic flow in terms of the OBO configuration. So, not significant change when going from single scene to multi scene in the selection and the application. So, as a conclusion, we've summarized some measurement results. Uh, for the evaluation of multi sim solutions, uh, both link selection and link aggregation for the remote driving users. Overall, we do note that uh, the multi sim solution uh, provides a very effective uh, uh, solution compared to the single sim case uh, in terms of how it's able to leverage uh, redundant networks and enhance our service continuity. In the next presentation, we'll summarize the lessons uh, uh, learned uh, in these trials and the experiences acquired and uh, our future outlook overall. Thank you for your attention. And with that, we move to the last presentation. Welcome once again. Uh, we present our final presentation in this webinar series. And uh, uh, this is titled Experiences and Lessons Learned uh, from the uh, Finland Trial Site uh, 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 Trials. 
Um, the conclusions that, uh, or the lessons that we try to draw uh, are centered uh, uh, primarily around the solution uh, that we had considered uh, for service continuity uh, in the remote tri driving trials that we saw earlier. Uh, one key aspect that was noted was that uh, 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 these multi-SIM uh, solutions uh, provided uh, a significant improvement in terms of service continuity when compared to the single SIM case, particularly in a user story like the one we have, uh, which uh, had very heavy traffic flows in the uplink direction. However, uh, it should be noted that uh, the current uh, uh, scenarios in, in, in most uh, uh, 5G uh, uh, networks, TDD days, uh, is that they have about um, uh, five to seven times uh, the capacity they mentioned in the downlink uh, 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 compared to the uplink. Uh, this would mean that the uplink capacity uh, would remain to continue, will continue to remain to be a severe bottleneck. Uh, particularly during the cases when you have uh, uh, busy hour periods uh, in terms of the, the metric, but also in the road where you start to have more connected automated vehicles traffic. Or even with new vehicles that, with, that are coming with more uh, demands in terms of the uplift capacity, uh, such as the example uh, of the image on the, on the right here, showing the much larger number of cameras. So in the final trial case, slide case, we only had uh, one camera uh, in the setup, uh, as well as the two LiDAR screens contributing the uh, about uh, 25 megabits uh, per second in terms of uplink traffic requirement, capacity requirement. So there is a still a need for the reconsideration of how the uplink and downlink are dimensioned uh, in networks to be able to support uh, applications such as, such as connected and automated mobility. Uh, second observation we, we draw regarding the use of autism, uh, it is noted that uh, in the final trial site, uh, we tell us a solution of the dual SIM configuration, uh, which are two physical SIMs. Uh, configurations with uh, uh, physical SIMs may not be scalable uh, for the scenarios where one may, may want to use even more networks uh, uh, to be able to alleviate the bottlenecks that we see in the uplink. Or in the case where the vehicle crosses across, uh, traverses across regions or borders uh, with multiple networks on, on either side. Uh, one solution uh, that does look uh, to seem to be quite promising is, uh, of course, embedded SIM uh, technology. Uh, uh, GSMA has produced uh, a specification for uh, over the updating uh, uh, of multiple uh, mobile network profiles on eSIM, which makes this uh, a solution quite interesting uh, when it comes uh, to the use of uh, uh, automotive and, and actually it, it is noted in, in, in GSM and some other publications that automotive is one of the key uh, driving solutions for this uh, eSIM uh, approach. Figure on the right shows the traditional SIM with a single mobile network operator, uh, whereas on the far right is an eSIM with a, a multiple network operator profiles uh, program. And the idea of uh, using multiple eSIMs uh, for, for automotive scenarios uh, has been gaining ground uh, in, in industry and uh, different associations uh, specified uh, in the quotes that we pick uh, from the various, uh, uh, various organizations here. Uh, a third observation we note is that uh, uh, multi-SIM solutions uh, still remain to, to be a, a proprietary uh, vendor-specific solution, and these may tend to behave uh, quite differently 
uh, even when operating in the same network in conditions. This is something that we, we also note in the, in the Mobix project, for the Mobix project where uh, we have multiple same solutions uh, being evaluated by, by different file sets. Um, these multi-sim solutions are also device or UV side solutions and they tend to uh, operate in a way that the networks are oblivious to the fact that they are serving a multi-sim device. And this may lead to a situation where the service provided by the network is suboptimal uh, because of this lack of that knowledge that they're serving a multi-sim uh, AUV. Uh, fortunately, uh, 3GPP, the third generation partnership project, has started uh, uh, specifying network enhancements to make the networks more aware and optimize for handling of multi-sim devices. And this work has started from um, V17, uh, where there's some announcements being proposed uh, for uh, multi-sim uh, uh, devices, with, which have uh, single transmit and single receive uh, 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 radio chains, as well as dual receive and single transmit devices. In release 18, uh, this work is continuing, uh, considering now dual devices with dual uh, uh, transmission and receiving uh, circuits. Um, it has been uh, an interesting experience uh, conducting trials uh, in realistic conditions or in open road mixed traffic. Typically, uh, the user story scenarios are planned and take assumptions that would usually consider uh, ideal operating conditions. However, uh, what we learned uh, from conducting multiple trials uh, in open roads, uh, uh, we do come across a number of uh, unique scenarios uh, that may actually uh, impact uh, the, uh, the measurement results and the, the different KPIs that we see from one run to another. For instance, in, in some trials, we noticed uh, there were lane closure from one trial day to another, which uh, may have an impact on the results uh, due to this uh, slowing down of traffic, a bit of traffic at certain parts of the road, or driving through construction sites with uh, multiple large vehicles that are rolling into the road and creating uh, shadowing effects and so on, or operating places there where you have to stop because of a priority lanes to for buses and so on. Um, the trials that we, we have conducted um, uh, would not have been possible uh, or would not have been possible to the level that we have experienced without the stakeholder engagement. Um, this is something that we should acknowledge, uh, uh, particularly uh, the collaboration uh, with the multi sim uh, OBU vendor uh, that has also used this opportunity uh, to be able to uh, to, to, to test uh, the, the new 5G enhancements in their product. Uh, this collaboration has been uh, a very good experience for both sides. Uh, also, uh, uh, the collaboration with the Finnish uh, Transport Communications Agency, Traficom, and where Traficom has served in the 5G Mobix Advisory Board, but at a local level, uh, uh, this uh, regulator has also provided 4G and 5G test spectrum license, as well as multiple uh, PNM and IDs for uh, out to be able to uh, 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 conduct a various tests. And also the local ecosystem uh, in, in Finland for 5G, the 5G test network Finland, uh, has provided a platform uh, to be able to, to share results at a local level and, and receive uh, very useful feedback. Useful. So although it's only two partners in Finland for us, but this has been an overall broader team effort. We thank you for your attention. Uh, uh, in this one.
And uh, with this, we've finished the presentations for today. As I mentioned at the chat box, we went a bit over time, but um, please stay with us for a little bit longer. We're going to dedicate a few more minutes for the Q&A session. Uh, so feel free to submit any questions that you may have uh, at the um, question box that you can see on your panel. Uh, and um, if you want, you can also mention the name of the speaker um, that you want to uh, address the question to. And as we wait, um, perhaps I can uh, already address a question to perhaps um, Edward. Uh, in uh, your opinion, what has been the most challenging aspect from a network performance perspective for the remote driving use case experimentation? Could you uh, tell us a bit about this? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Sabian. Yeah, I, we would say I think the, the uplink limitation was, we knew it was there, but it was even more more constraining than we initially anticipated. Uh, as mentioned in the presentation, our setup is still relatively simple in terms of the uplink traffic that, that could be generated. And we see this as something that will be quite a bit of a challenge going forward, looking at some of the other uh, uh, concepts being considered for, for remote driving. Thank you for the answer, uh, for the question. Um, I don't see any questions coming in yet. Um, we do have a thank you from Topias Wotila. Thank you for that, from uh, Good Meal. Um, perhaps one last question from my side. Um, Edward, uh, Timo, or uh, Oscar, feel free to um, to answer. Um, in terms of uh, regulations, are there any considerations, any any lessons learned in that uh, perspective that derive from uh, the, the trials? Anything that we can foresee in the, the future? Um, yeah, I, maybe I could say something at least from also from the network side. So I think earlier on in the project, um, yeah, there were some discussions of uh, under the mandate that uh, a remote driven or autonomous vehicle has to have connectivity to multiple networks. Uh, this is something that, uh, of course, it's a, it's a safety safety critical uh, asset, uh, which may also risk other road users and so on. Uh, this is something that we, we try to track to see if there's any evolution in that uh, early proposal, but we haven't seen that yet. But uh, I think if it's something that uh, uh, could go through into actually becoming full regulation, it's something that will greatly impact uh, the perspective on multi sim type of solutions. And not just within a country, but also in how the vehicle then will transit uh, with a mode, under a multi sim connectivity from one country uh, to the other. Right, thank yeah, you. That's my two cents. Yeah. So. Thank you so much, Edward. Um, I don't see there are any questions, so I hope this <laughs> means you were also pretty clear with your uh, presentations. Um, I want to thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, today. Um, many thanks to the speakers uh, for the insightful presentations and. Uh, um, I would like to let you know that um, next week we have uh, more webinars coming up. Um, um, three from the um, one from the French trial side, uh, one from the German, the Dutch, and then the week after that we also have uh, a webinar on the South Korean trial side. So uh, please. Um, you can you can find uh, the registration and more information on the news page and the events page on the 5G Mobix webinar. And uh, we hope to see you there as well, so we can uh, for for more insights in the 5G Mobix uh, recent demos and trials. 
Thank you. Thank you again to all the speakers and thank you to everyone who attended the, the webinar today and I'm wishing you all a lovely afternoon. Thank you.